because the idea that any person on earth can tell you with such specifics what happens when you die just blows my mind that somebody on earth another person can just say to you oh yes and what happens when you get to heaven yes you you'll meet jesus he's wearing a white robe there's a little gold piping on the sleeve and then you go in this room and you eat eggs and you watch f troop are you kidding? What are you talking about? You're just a person like I am. You are clueless. You have no idea what happens. Don't you me. think Rick believes it? Of course he believes it. But how, how ridiculous is that? Like if I went to the Himalayas to find the holiest of holy men in the world who had all the answers, the guru, when I got to the top of the mountain, I said, please, Master, can you, can you help me with the ultimate meaning of life? He'd say, yeah, there's a guy, Rick, in Long Beach, uh, Rick Warren. Go ask him. He knows exactly what happens when you die. And, you know, it's, that is my ultimate message. Unless a god told you personally what happens when you die, it all came from another person with no more mental powers than you have, and you don't know. So just man up and say, I don't know. But Meanwhile, Pope Benedict opened Holy Week celebrating Palm Sunday. As the church molestation scandal continues to keep the Vatican on the defensive for the institutional crisis that one Catholic newspaper is calling, quote, the largest in centuries. All right, now we're going to have a fair and balanced debate. Yesterday I asked Christopher Hitchens, author of God is Not Great. A man named Joseph Ratzinger, when he was a cardinal, from 2001 onwards, was given the job as head of the Sacred Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith of covering it up. I mean, we now have the letters that he wrote in that capacity to every bishop in the church saying, in effect, um, this is all to be kept within our, our own conclave. Uh, you're not to involve the secular authorities. Um, and making it very evident that the, the main priority was not justice for the victims, but protection of the criminals. The, the, uh, the only thing they were worried about was the damage done to the church, not to the children. It also turns out that he was individually responsible, at least twice, once in his own diocese of Munich in Germany, um, where a priest called Father Hulemann was on his watch. He was copied on the memo. He, there are claims he didn't see it, but his name is right on the memo saying, what are we going to do about this man who was reassigned so he could work again with children? And now the most even more terrible case, I think, maybe the most horrible yet, the poor deaf children of, of Wisconsin in the uh, school where Father Murphy was operating, um, were pleading with the Vatican, pleading with Ratzinger's office to say, what are we going to do about this? And nothing. They were told, uh, basically, don't do a thing. And uh, Murphy wrote personally to Ratzinger, saying, look, I, I know I did all this, but I'm an old man now, and you know, please leave me alone. And well, compassion, Chris compassion was felt only for him, this terrible criminal. It's not a bureaucratic crisis, you see, or just a political one or institutional one. It's a moral crisis for any Catholic with any conscience. This man is not just the CEO. They claim he is the vicar of Christ on earth. So the question now is raised, what Christ has a man like this, with all this on his hands, as his vicar? And certainly with uh, more and more information that we're learning, um, the case gets curiouser and curiouser. Christopher Hitchens, Not thank you so much. Not curiouser and curiouser, no. Excuse me, no. Clearer and clearer that the head of the church is directly responsible for the rape and torture of children. The fundamentalists have actually read the books, and they're right about them. These books are every bit as intolerant, every bit as divisive as the Osama bin Ladens of the world or the Jerry Falwells of the world suggest. And I'm not a, uh, necessarily equating the two of them mor in moral terms. So once we dignify those claims, we are really hostage to their contents. I mean, the creator of the universe does hate homosexuals. If you read the Bible, at the very least, homosexual men, gay sex, is an abomination. It, it is spelled out in Leviticus. It is, it, this edict is ramified in Romans. It's, you can take Jesus and half his moods and get some really beautiful ethical precepts like the Golden Rule. But Jesus also said things like, in Luke 19... Anyone who doesn't want me to, to reign over him, bring him before me and slay him before me. Okay? I guarantee you that the inquisitors of the Middle Ages who were burning heretics alive 
for five solid centuries, they, they had read the whole New Testament. They had read the Sermon on the Mount. They found some way to square their behavior with, with the ministry of Jesus. But it's not all bad news, because it does mean that those who crash planes full of living people into buildings full of living people, shouting that God is great and believing it's going to get them to paradise, aren't going to get there. <laughs> Well, about, about one, that, one is only sorry. One is only one is only sorry, and very sorry in my case, that there's no moment at the moment of their extinction. There's no moment when they think, "Ah, damn!" It isn't. <laughs> but wishful thinking can't help that either. So my my settled consideration verdict on this is: <coughs> they want to die, and I'm here to help them do so. And so should you be, and everyone in this room should be ashamed until they've done something to kill at least one jihadist or bring about the physical and moral and political and military defeat and humiliation of these people. And the God in which they believe. And the non-existent deity in which, in which they dare to take permission to try and kill us all. Christopher, have you, have you ever prayed? Once for a hard-on. <laughs> facing a problem at this moment. There is, I'm happy to say, a religion of peace in this world, but it's not Islam. Okay. To call Islam a religion of peace, as we hear ceaselessly reiterated, is completely delusional. Now, Jainism actually is a religion of peace. Jainism is a, that the core principle of Jainism is nonviolence. Gandhi got his nonviolence from the Jains. The crazier you get as a Jane, the less we have to worry about you. <laughs> yeah, it is. Jane extremists are, are actually, they are, they are paralyzed by their pacifism. Jane extremists just, they, they can't take their eyes off the ground when they walk lest they step on an ant. They filter every sip of water through cheesecloth, lest they sw swallow and thereby kill a bug. So the problem, uh, notice, the problem is not religious extremism, okay, because extremism is not a problem if your core beliefs are truly nonviolent. The problem isn't fundamentalism, okay, which we often hear this said. These are euphemisms. I mean, the, the only problem with Islamic fundamentalism are the fundamentals of Islam. If you look at people who are religious today who are not in conflict with science, they have viewed their religious texts as a spiritual, something that gives them spiritual support, not as a science textbook. The, the, inter, the, the conflict in society is when you have those who are still religious who want to use their religious text as their access point to understanding the natural world and persistent efforts of the past to make that happen have just simply failed. The, the, the Bible does not work as a science textbook. In fact, Galileo knew this, and he himself was a religious man. He's famously quoted as saying, the Bible tells you how to go to heaven, not how the heavens go. <laughs> sort of mysticism and Age of Aquarius type stuff. And one of the reasons why she uh, felt that that was the right place to be was because she thought that scientists were arrogant, that they had all these answers to questions they didn't have any right to have answers to. But with her New Age friends, she would sometimes raise questions about their beliefs. And she noticed a pattern emerging, talking to her New Age friends versus talking to scientists, that scientists would sometimes say they didn't know the answer to something and that her New Age friends would never say that. They had an answer for everything. And she realized, actually, science does claim to know the answer to some things. But there are other things that it very quickly admits it doesn't know the answer to. Dinesh just gave you a list, a laundry list of things. Where did the universe come from? Why is there any universe? Is there life after death? And he says, and science has no clue about any of these things, as if that's a bad thing. Scientists, 
are extremely proud of the fact that we know we know some things and we know there are other things we don't know. We know where the dividing line is between what we know and what we don't know because of good reasons. For why there is a universe rather than not, we don't know the answer to that. Is there life after death? We know the answer to that. Why? Because we know what we're made of. We know how it acts. We know there is nothing to keep any sort of soul alive after the body dies. And that goes back to Ian's discussion of how does science know some things? Is science the only way of knowing things? Science is clearly not the only way of knowing things. There are other ways of truth. For example, mathematical truths are outside of science. They are logical truths, not empirical ones. But it would be a mistake to think that religion is a different way of obtaining truth that is outside everything else. If God existed, the one thing that if there, it were, there were an omnipotent being that cared about us here on earth, I would expect clear instructions. I would expect a book that I knew exactly what it said. It was clear that it was right, and I would be able to follow it. If God did not exist, I would expect all sorts of different books. They would contradict each other. Some of them would be brilliant in parts. They would be silly in other parts. They would be uplifting in parts. They would be uh, very depressing in other parts. They would be edited collections. They would be personal memoirs. They would all disagree with each other. Which of these two theories fits the data? Thank you.